the 22nd meeting of the Justice Committee in 2020. This is a hybrid meeting of the committee, with some members uh, attending in person and uh, some online. We have no apologies uh, this morning. The first item on our agenda is the committee's final evidence session uh, in its stage one inquiry uh, into the defamation and malicious publication Scotland Bill. And I welcome the Minister and her officials uh, to the meeting, Ashton, and Minister for Community Safety, supported by, ministers, uh, supported by officials from the Scottish Government. Welcome um, to all of you uh, to our meeting this morning. And I invite the Minister to make some short opening remarks before we uh, move to questions. Minister. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the Committee. And thank you very much for inviting me to give evidence today on the Defamation and Malicious Publication Scotland Bill. Um, on this bill, obviously the normal legislative process has been interrupted by the public health emergency and almost 10 months after introduction, we are now approaching the end of stage one. So I'd like to express my gratitude to the committee and to the clerks as well um, for your persistence. So in some ways, um, the bill before us is not the normal type that the committee considers because this bill is by and large um, a product of the Scottish Law Commission. Um, as far back as March 2016, it published a discussion paper, and more than four years later, here we are discussing the outcome of that work. So I'd like to thank the Commission for its careful and diligent work on this reform. So the Bill takes forward all the substantive recommendations made by the Scottish Law Commission. It looked at defamation law in the whole, and we have before us is one Bill that contains a substantial part of the law on defamation laid out now in modern language. The law of defamation has to strike the right balance between two values that sometimes pull in different directions. That's the principle of expression and protection of reputation. Now, both of those are fundamental human rights and are of vital importance in a modern democracy. Um, and I'd like to take a few moments to look at some of the changes that are proposed in the bill, none of which I'm sure will be news to the committee. So the bill defines what constitutes a defamatory statement, and this is a positive step to define what defamation is. Other provisions in the bill set out what defamation is not. And the standard common law definition was set out in 1934, and the bill takes this on but expresses it in more modern language. We introduce a threshold test of serious harm that must be met before an action for defamation can proceed. And in my opinion, the test is needed to ensure that only those claims where actual evidence of harm are allowed to proceed. We do, not, we do not achieve an appropriate balance if we allow claims to proceed on the legal presumption that in all cases damage has been done. The bill makes important provisions covering the role of secondary publishers in defamation law and the current definition of publication is wide and means that the law can be abused to silence legitimate free expression. Secondary publishers can be induced to act as censors, removing content irrespective of its accuracy or its importance. And ultimately, I believe that it should be for a court to determine rights, not those who may be motivated by more um, by economics than balancing fundamental rights. And this is what the bill seeks to enable. Malicious publication is closely aligned with defamation, but it's distinct and it protects different interests. And the balance between the two should, therefore, I believe, be different. The Commission gave detailed and thorough consideration to this area and recognised that without it, there'd be a gap in Scots law. And the bill doesn't weaken the current um, definitions, it merely replicates them. So finally, I'd like to touch on the Derbyshire principle. So I favour a statement of the principle in the bill that although public authorities have a reputation that may need to be protected, this um, must be done through the ballot box and not through the court. So overall, the bill aims to ensure that our law of defamation is fit for the 21st century. It provides a clear and accessible framework that more appropriately balances freedom of expression and protection of individual reputation. Um, I believe that the bill gets this balance right, and I'm happy to take any questions from the committee about how we have struck that balance. Th thank you, Minister. That's very helpful. And you've touched on a number of issues that members will want to explore with you that have been raised with us in our, in our evidence uh, sessions uh, to date. Can I, can I start with one of those areas that you, that you touched on, which is, um, of course, this is a bill that's, which emanates from the work of the Scottish Law Commission, but it doesn't mirror in entirety in its entirety the, the work of the Scottish Law, Law Commission. It makes some 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 changes, some differences. Um, and one of those differences is that the Scottish Law Commission, as I understand it, did not recommend that de defamation be defined on the face of the legislation, 
but the bill, of course, does that, and moreover does that in language which is different from the um, established language, language that we've used in uh, Scots law for some 80 or 90 years now. So can I ask, why did the government decide to depart from the Scottish Law Commission's recommendation and to um, uh, provide a definition, <coughs> a statutory definition of defamation, <coughs> excuse me, and, and, and why did the government decide not just to uh, copy and paste the language that we've already used in Scots law for some 90 odd years uh, in, in doing that? Mm -hmm. Yes, you're quite right that, um, you know, substantively this is the bill, you know, that the Scottish Law Commission developed. Um, and it varies from that in very few small number of areas and definition is obviously one of those areas. So, and the reason that we've done that is because reputation is of vital importance to individuals. And the law of defamation is obviously about protecting that reputation. And I think the law around that, therefore, there needs to be as, um, it needs to be as clear and it needs to be as accessible as possible. So having a, a definition, a statutory definition of that on the face of the bill, I think will help with that clarity. Um, so in terms of the, the phrasing, um, the Law Society, I think the committee's heard from them on this, and uh, they said that the definition does reflect the common law test. And also, um, the definition is, is meant to be a simple restatement, um, but in modern language, of the common law test that um, was set out by Lord Atkin in the case of Sim versus Stretch. Um, as you've rightly pointed out, that is now 84 years old. Um, and it sometimes needs to be explained to juries. And what happens is it's explained to juries in the terms that we have put into the bill. So I think that this is, um, it's, it's important, and I think it's useful to have the definition in there. Um, some of our witnesses have suggested that the bill um, could usefully state on its face <coughs> that this definition is not intended to be set in stone. It's set in statute, but it's not intended to be set in stone. And, and, and uh, as defamation continues, uh, to uh, develop, and in Scotland it, it tends to develop slowly because we have very few defamation cases, the, the courts will want from time to time to revise and revisit aspects of the law of defamation, including perhaps its very definition, um, and will want to ensure that, 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 that there's a degree of continuity between the law after enactment and the law um, before enactment, especially if, as you've just said, the purpose of the definition uh, in the bill is to give effect to what the common law already um, uh, provides. So what, have you reflected on whether you think the bill could usefully be amended or whether you think it would be an, un, un, an unhelpful amendment if the bill were to say expressly that the courts should continue to refer to common law as they develop the law of defamation through the, you know, the trickle, the handful of cases that do come before them in Scotland? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. I think that obviously the definition does reflect the common law and we've also got the explanatory notes that go along with that so I think anybody looking at that will understand that it, it does reflect that. Um, so obviously there are additional elements so you know you could be looking at the um, including the onus on proof of presumption or falsity or malice. Um, they are left to be dealt with by common law and I think that the court when they're looking at um, the definition they'll have that in mind and they'll see that the you know, the continued relevance of, you know, case law that has built up over time. But I, I do take the point on there. I know that um, this is an issue that has been raised by the Law Society. Um, I know that Professors Reed and Blackie also raised this with the committee. Um, and I can commit to looking at this issue further. Um, obviously, I'll, you know, consider the committee's report. And if you, you know, you make recommendations on that area, I will certainly look at it. One of the things that strikes me about the law of defamation is that I mean, the single biggest change to the law of defamation in recent years has been the creation of the Reynolds defence. That was, the, I think everybody welcomes that. I don't think we've had any evidence that, um, that, that countermands that view. Everybody welcomes the addition of that, of that defence in the, in the law of defamation. And that, of course, was judge-made law. Um, that, that wasn't a defence that was created by statute. It was a, a, a defence that was created through, through case law in the ordinary way of common law development. And I think a number of our witnesses have suggested to us that we wouldn't want to see uh, this bill being interpreted by the courts as if it were and had to be or was intended to be the last word in the ongoing development of the law of defamation in Scotland. And that, that, that's a view that you and the Scottish Government share. Is that right? Thank you. Uh, Rona Mackay, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, yeah, if I could just follow up on, on the convener's question there, just with a wee bit of specific um, question. We, we have heard a bit of concern about um, the use of the phrase, for example, ordinary people, rather than um, reasonable type person, person type test. And, you know, the phrase ordinary people might sort of reinforce um, 
social prejudices, etc. Um, can you say that you know this is something that would be looked at um, if there was enough, um, you know, sort of concern about it? And and if if you felt that, um, can you maybe say why you think it's okay to use the phrase ordinary people? Mm. Yeah. So I think. As I've already said, it's just meant to be a simple restatement in, you know, modern language of the common law test. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's good about this process that we're going through now, is if we're going to define what defamation is, I think it's, um, you know, something that we all, as part of this legislature, as far as possible, should be able to agree upon and then vote upon so that we are all clear on what that is. So um, the use of the words uh, ordinary persons. So it's not meant to refer to, you know, any specific, you know, part of society or section of society. It's just um, to suggest, you know, a general objective legal construct. So, um, as I said earlier, I think in modern practice, it's sometimes explained to juries um, being the words um, that would tend to make ordinary readers think the worst of the pursuer. And I'm not aware of it having had any difficulties so far in the courts. But I'll ask um, perhaps Michael wants to add a little bit more to, to that for Rona. Uh, yeah, as, as the Minister said, um, I mean, we, we've not tried to um, revolutionise what we mean by defamation, uh, defamation in this bill. Um, ordinary persons is uh, as a, a standard... Um, description used by sheriffs to the jury in a defamation case. Um, they, they refer to it as words that would tend to make ordinary readers think the worst of the pursuer. Um, so, you know, the, what, what we've done with this bill, we think, is carry over this idea of right-thinking persons of society generally. We've simply carried it over into more modern words. And a court looking at this provision along with the explanatory notes, we think we'd understand that and would interpret it accordingly. I think Annabel Ewing wants to ask questions about um, the serious harm test. So Annabel, over to you, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, Minister. Um, uh, uh, yes, I wanted to um, raise some issues concerning the serious harm test. I note the minister, in her opening um, remark, um, suggested that um, the, the, the focus of, of, of what the government was trying to do was to ensure that it, there was actual evidence of harm, rather than um, cases where it might be viewed as, as frivolous, I suppose. But I think actual evidence of harm and serious harm are not exactly the same thing. In the evidence we have taken, um, certainly the view has been expressed that setting the bar at serious harm uh, risks introducing a, a barrier, if you like, to uh, ordinary pursuers um, <clears throat> to protect their reputation is likely to make the whole process much more complex. Uh, and costly. I just wonder if the Minister could comment on those concerns that have been raised. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that the, the threshold test is a sensible reform of defamation law, because I think if you're, if you're going to come into a court and say that your reputation has been damaged, then I think you should be able to therefore prove to the court that it has actually been damaged. So I think it is a, it's a sensible starting point. Um, and I think also it will give confidence as well to those who've been notified um, that a statement they've published is defamatory, that they'll be then confident that that damage will then have to be proved in the court. Um, I don't think it will make things more complicated um, or expensive. Um, I think that... Um, I mean, an individual who's been defamed, they obviously have, uh, at the moment, they will have recourse to simple procedures. So I don't know if the committees um, had discussion about that already for raising action and damages. And this court procedure is obviously specifically designed for lay people. So that means that they're, you know, that access to justice avenue is open to them. And um, you know, my understanding is that a procedure can be raised there for as little as 19 pounds. So I don't think that there is an access to justice issue there, no. I, I, I thank the minister for her answer. I, I think 
some of, some of the witnesses that we have heard evidence from um, have pointed in that regard to what has happened south of the border. It, by dint of interalia, there being a threshold set at not just harm, but serious harm. And perhaps um, uh, in advance of the next stage, it might be worth um, uh, the Minister having her officials investigate that uh, further, because I think um, what we are seeing down south are very complex uh, processes, uh, just in fact dealing with the serious harm element. Um, it, on a wider level, I, I hear what the Minister says, um, but I think there is a feeling, certainly among some witnesses, that um, the, the, the approach of the bill in this particular regard is very much um, a hammer to crack uh, a nut, because they, they feel it's, a, it's the, what the legislation south of the border did was to seek to resolve problems that had arisen uh, in England in terms of defamation. That we have very few cases here, uh, and um, I think the feeling was that this was very much an approach that embodied uh, an English solution to an English problem. I think that was actually the quote from the representative from the Faculty of Advocates who came before us to give evidence. I wonder if the, the Minister would comment on that wider issue, that the, the, the Bill is not getting the balance quite right in this particular regard on the issue of serious harm. Thank you. Well, I think the Bill is getting the balance right. So I think if you look at the Bill across the whole piece of legislation, um, it is attempting to strike that balance between um, the things that we've discussed earlier. And, and overall, the bill is aimed at reducing costs for all the parties, um, introducing more effective remedies for protecting reputation and stronger protections for freedom of expression, which would um, you know, be an answer to the, to the member's question on that. I think in terms of you know, English solutions you know, to an English problem, I, I don't agree with that at all as a characterisation. Um, you know, clearly, the Scottish Law Commission um, developed this set of proposals. You know, they took a wide-ranging look at the Scots law of defamation. Um, you know, the committee will be aware they made a large number of recommendations um, for that. So they, they certainly did not confine their approach with looking at you know, um, English law of defamation and whether we would just replicate it here. That was not the approach that they took at all to that. And obviously, chief among their recommendations was that there should be a threshold test of serious harm. So um, I understand what the stakeholders are saying with that, but I'd come back to the point, um, and I guess it will be up to the committee to decide if they, if they think that this is the right approach, that if a person says that their reputation has been damaged by a statement, that they should show how it has been damaged. To me, that seems like that is the right, the right approach to be taken here. At the moment, obviously, the law assumes that that, you know, presumes that that damage has been done. And, and I don't think that creates the right balance. So I think this bill does put the, the law into creating um, a better balance on that. Um, and I'll ask um, Michael, do you have anything you'd like to add in to that? I, I don't think there's much I can add. As the Minister um, has emphasised, the Scottish Law Commission um, looked at the law of defamation and indeed malicious publication um, in the Scottish context. And you know, they, they, they didn't just copy the 2013 Act or provisions of the 2013 Act just for you know, no reason. They, they felt that the reform of Scots law required um, the, 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 their recommendations, and you know, that's what we've put forward in this bill. Annabel, do you have any further questions on this? Or? Uh, I think we have probably uh, exhausted that particular subject for the moment. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Th th thank you, Annabel. Uh, Rona Mackay wants to ask a follow-up on this, as does uh, Liam MacArthur, as do I. But I'll take Rona first. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Yes, just, just to follow up on that, um, we heard um, media witnesses um, talk about the um, vexatious litigation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. warning letters, which you know they, they perceive to be quite mm -hmm. a problem. Um, do you think the serious harm test will um, stop that happening? Because legal stakeholders have said it's kind of part and parcel of, of, of what they do and it's, it's, just, it's just the way it works. So do you see that the serious harm test having an, an effect on that? Mm. I would hope that it would have. I think it's, you know, it's difficult to quantify in advance you know, how much an effect it would, ha would have or indeed you know, how much an effect this type of thing is already having. I think... Um, I think it would be very difficult to measure that at the moment. 
Um, I think the officials will probably get, be able to give some examples from England and Wales in a moment on how that is working down there. So we'll come to that point in a moment. But I think, you know, the general point about this is exactly as a member said that, you know, that we, ha we have, and I think the committee have heard, um, you know, quite a bit of evidence on this about this chilling effect, you know, that happens if you create in content and then you're, you're served with a letter and, you know, the secretary publisher then immediately just decides to pull it, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, you know, which obviously does affect freedom of, of expression. So, you know, one of the key aims of the bill is to, to give confidence to people about, you know, their rights and also their obligations in regard to, to defamation law. And I think that having everything in one place, having it clear, you know, having it accessible will do that. Um, and I think the threshold test um, is a really important part of that. Thank you. Liam. Thank you. Just following up um, Annabel Ewing's line of questioning, um, she, I think, quoted um, Duncan Hamilton from the faculty talking about um, what, what they perceive to be a, a, an English solution to an English mm. problem. I think the, other, the, the supporting evidence I think he was drawing on was that there wasn't examples of uh, too much litigation in terms of defamation, but if anything, actually mm. uh, too little. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the experience we've had since the passing of the Defamation Act um, south of the border is at least an, an opportunity to see if, if there was any kind of movement of more litigation north of the border where there was a, a lower test, and there doesn't seem to have been evidence uh, of that. So while I take on board the point made in relation to the Law Commission's um, uh, recommendations, uh, actually what the faculty is saying here is that um, uh, there is that there's actually a benefit in having um, uh, uh, examples of this law being being tested, which we're just not seeing at the moment. And, and, and by setting the, the serious um, uh, harm threshold um, uh, higher, uh, there is a risk that that's, that that's choked off, which is not necessarily to the benefit of, of um, uh, the, the public generally, including those that Annabelle Ewing was referring to balance of the bill isn't it and so if someone is is going to is saying that their reputation has been damaged you would expect them to be able to show how it's been damaged would you well, accept that? I, I think that i mean that was certainly accepted but uh, i suppose that the the the, the, the serious or the level of the, this, mm -hmm. the level of that harm mm -hmm. um, is then for the court to decide and will be reflected and I, I suppose in terms of any damages mm -hmm. that are, are ultimately awarded mm -hmm. uh, but by setting the threshold so high, um, actually the, 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 uh, the balance has been um, or potentially will be tipped uh, too far in the favour of one where there isn't at the moment evidence um, that there uh, that, 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 that cases are, too many cases mm -hmm. are coming, uh, coming mm -hmm. forward, if anything, as, as mm -hmm. I say, the faculty were pointing to the fact that there is a very limited uh, number of cases. That, that is right. We, there is a very, very low level of cases at the moment, but I'll ask Michael just to um, speak to uh, obviously, the, the harm test and how that's had an effect in England and Wales. Yeah, I mean, in England and Wales, what we've seen is, you know, we've, we've, the number of defamation cases have actually increased um, almost year on year since the 2013 Act. So it doesn't seem to have, um, you know, overly prevented cases from arising in that jurisdiction. There are, there are examples where courts have determined in individual cases that the threshold test hasn't been. Um, hasn't been met and obviously they threw that out and you know there are, there are a couple of cases of the committee once I can um, give them those examples um, I mean uh, uh, in terms of the the, the threshold test and, and the level that's set at um, I mean the the Scottish Law Commission have obviously considered all these um, issues and and they made their recommendation that this was the appropriate level for um, cases uh, in Scotland and you know, that's what we have taken forward in this bill. Uh, and can I, can I just be clear that, I mean, the, the defamation uh, uh, addresses the relationship between freedom of expression on the one hand and protection of reputation on the other. And moving the threshold from harm to serious harm tilts that balance in favour of freedom of expression. It, that's the policy aim behind the bill that the government is seeking to pursue, is that right? To rebalance it in favour of freedom of expression. Yes. Yeah. So that, 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 that's, an, that's an intended policy outcome of the bill. Um, it was an intended policy outcome of the Scottish Law Commission. Yes. Is it, is it, is it, is it the government's intended policy outcome? It is. The government's we bill. took the recommendations um, from the Scottish Law Commission, and I also agree with them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. We're going to move to the Derbyshire principle, um, and John Finney has questions about that. So, John, please. 
Thank you very much, Convener. Um, good morning, Minister and team. Um, Minister, the, this principle that public, a ban on public authorities suing for de defamation, there's been a lot of discussion. This has uh, posed a number of questions in, in weeks. I'm sure you've followed that. Now, if, if I noted you correctly this morning, you referred to the ballot box and not the court being used for issues. Um, we know that the definition includes uh, exemptions for business charities, businesses and charities from time to time deliver public services. I would have thought one of the challenges is that the, the contracts for the many different range of bodies that provide a, a wide range of public services, these contracts don't necessarily align with the local government or indeed central government electoral process. Um, stakeholders have concluded that Section 2, uh, the statutory version of the principle of the bill, both expands on the common law position, so a wider selection of organisations are prevented from protecting their reputation wealth, at the same time failing to protect all those who criticise public service delivery from defamation uh, litigation. Uh, arguably, Minister, it satisfies no one. Can you explain the Scottish Government's rationale for legislating in this way, please? Yes. So uh, the aim of this provision is simply to, to place on a statutory footing the common law principle that um, public authorities cannot raise defamation litigation. And public authorities do have a reputation, as the member has noted, but they need to protect it using political means and not defamation law. Um, obviously, there is a public interest here um, that's served by allowing you know, comment on the actions of democratically elected bodies. And that's the fundamental rationale behind the Derbyshire principle. Um, you know, I, I listened to the evidence that was given to the committee on this matter, and I think that you know, it is universally accepted that this is a really important principle. Um, but perhaps there was a little bit of difference in, you know, in how that principle should be drafted. So, I mean, I just want to be quite clear that, as far as I'm concerned, the bill before you today will protect those who criticise public service delivery, even if it's delivered by a, a private body. And, you know, it's also my opinion that those who criticise public services provided by private companies are sufficiently protected by the provisions in the bill. But I'll let um, Michael explain, you know, about the list of factors and also um, the member raised um, some of the drafting about from time to time. So I'll let Michael um, just explain that a little bit more for the committee. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this... Um this drafting um, appears um, in the 1998 Human Rights Act, um, and it's been used in a number of bills since then. So the, the courts have um, are aware of this form of words. They've interpreted it for more than 20 years, um, and we think that the the approach taken in this bill should mirror um, that approach um, or that form of words. Uh, the court, when it's considering public authority, will obviously take into account. Um, you know, certain factors about what that private company is doing, whether it's on contract. Um, you'll be aware that in, in Scotland here, um, the Lord Justice Clark led Dorian decided in a case, Ali versus Serco, just last year, um, on a number of factors or the, or the approach that the court would take to interpreting that form of words. And we think that the, the draft in, in the bill provides a, you know, a sensible and flexible approach to how the, the courts will interpret you know, what a public authority is for defamation law. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, these replies. Um, um, certainly, notwithstanding what I've heard from both the Minister and the official, the concerns remain about the drafting and uh, the suggestion that, that this would increase uncertainty for organisations mm -hmm. uh, outside the public service which deliver public services such as our prisons and electronic monitoring, we've heard universities mentioned in the past. It, can I clarify, Minister, and I, 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 this would clearly have to be reflected in the, the committee's stage one report. Is, are you plans to bring forward any amendments in this particular area at all, please? I don't currently have any plans to bring forward any, any amendments on this at the moment. I think, you know, we need to make sure we take a flexible approach with this. Um, so that courts can deal with um, complex cases, um, with nuanced cases. And I think also as things develop, you know, public service delivery um, is not what it was 20 years ago. So we, we need to bear that in mind and, and allow that sort of flexibility of approach. Um, 
I can say to the committee that I would certainly be happy to look at the committee's recommendations on this point and, um, you know, carefully consider that. And I, I will take another look at the evidence on this. Okay, thank you for that, Minister. That's reassuring. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you, Mr. Finney. Can I just ask a follow-up question, Minister, about that? As Mr. Finney um, has indicated in his questions, so, some of our witnesses have indicated that they think that Section 2 is too broadly drawn, and some of our witnesses have indicated that they think it's too narrowly drawn. And it seems to me, um, uh, speaking personally, that that, that that difference of view um, depends on what different people think the purpose of the rule in Derbyshire is. And there are two options, I think. And I, and I wonder what the option is that's preferred by the Scottish Government. The first interpretation of the rule in Derbyshire is that it's designed to protect people who are elected. Um, uh, sorry, it's not designed to protect them. It's, des it's des designed to capture only people who are elected. So that if you are elected, and, you, and, this, and this goes back to your original re remarks, which Mr Finney picked up on, if, if, you are, if you are elected through the ballot box, then you do not have um, recourse to the law of defamation uh, if you are criticised by members of the public about the way in which you are performing your functions. Um, but the, there's, an, there's another view which um, goes to what you've just said, Minister, which is that the um, way in which public services are delivered uh, has changed beyond recognition over the course of the last uh, decade or two. And so there are those who say that really the purpose of the, uh, of, 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 of the rule in Derbyshire should be to protect those who criticise the way in which public services are delivered, irrespective of who they're delivered by, whether they're delivered by people like us who are elected or by arm's length organisations or, um, uh, or, or, or corporations. So we, we'll, we'll have a, a clearer view about what the drafting of Section 2 should look like only if we have a really clear view to start with about what the purpose of the rule in Derbyshire is. So in the government's view, which is it? Right. I think that, if I may, if I may respectfully suggest, that might lead you into difficulty with the drafting of Section 2, because you can't, in a single section... Um, yeah. you, you, might, you might find it difficult in a single section to um, protect two interests which are not always compatible with each other. Yeah, I take, I take the convener's point on that. But I would also make the point that this... You know, it doesn't exp expand on the common law definition, so we're, re we're replicating that in here. We're just trying to, you know, sort of codify it, but, um, you know, do that in a sensible way and do that in a way that's flexible as well. But I I've said to the committee, if the committee has a strong interest in this and does not think that the this is the right balance, that I will endeavour to look at this again with the drafters and, and see if there, if there is more that we can do to... To, um, to see if it, there's maybe a way that it could be changed or maybe there's something that we could put in the explanatory notes that might be helpful, perhaps. When uh, Lord Keith delivered his judgment in the Scottish law lord, of course, who delivered his judgment in the Derbyshire case, even though it was a case from Eng England and Wales, um, uh, he didn't think that the rule in Derbyshire was protecting the delivery of public services. He thought that the rule in Derbyshire was protecting uh, those who want to criticise uh, uh, councillors, members mm -hmm. of parliament who are, who, are who, who are directly elected. So I think that is an issue. The, the, the principle underpinning the Derbyshire rule, I think, is an issue that we'll mm -hmm. want to draw out. Um, as the um, bill uh, progresses. Mm -hmm. But I've said enough about that. We're going to move now to um, online behaviour. And Rona Mackay has questions about that, please. Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, online behaviour. Um, so the bill um, exempts secondary publishers from any liability and defamation. Um, we know that in the USA, um, they take a similar approach and um, online service providers take no action to remove, you know, even clearly defamatory content. Um, do, do you accept that this is a risk and um, do you think the bill should have gone a bit further in, with regard to online content? So do you mean in terms of like uh, the sort of takedown approach? Is that, is I, that I was kind coming of on to ask about that. Yeah, just that, you know, that obviously it, it, okay. it doesn't have a takedown approach like the Defamation Act 2013. Um, and it also repeals um, Section 1 of the 1996 Act, which require secondary publishers to take reasonable care. Mm. So it, it's just, you know, to ask your opinion on what someone should do if they've been defamed. I mean, mm. most people would just want that material taken down. Mm. Uh, you know, so do you think more could have been done in that respect mm. um, to protect people? Yeah, so I'm obviously aware that a number of stakeholders have made, you know, have made arguments around this area. So the aim of the provision you know, it's not to give internet companies free reign. So that's not what, what we're going for here. Um, but we have to balance that with the principle that, you know, secondary publishers 
uh, you know, they're not actively responsible for the content, yet presently they're obviously going to be held liable for that. Um, so I think the committee's heard from um, Scottish Pen on this, um, that, you know, this will make sure that the focus is more firmly on the defamatory statement, where it comes from, um, and on the authors, the editors and the publishers of those statements. So I think... You know, in terms of takedown, I, you know, I think that that's, that is interesting. I'm wondering if, um, I think it's a lot more complicated. I think it, that superficially, it sounds like the takedown procedure sounds ideal. It sounds like that might, you know, be a silver bullet and it will fix these issues. I think in practice, the way that we are seeing that working down south shows that it is not as um, effective. I don't think it's working as effectively um, down there as you know, it was maybe hoped that it would do. So, um, Michael, could you um, explain for the committee a little bit about how that takedown procedure is, is working or not working um, down south? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the takedown procedure um, will usually involve a person who thinks they've been defamed by a statement contacting the, the internet um, with a, a notice of complaint. Uh, the, the internet, the website operator would, would send that notice to the person who has posted the statement um, and if the person who posted the statement, um, you know, wants to stand behind it, then the statement stays up. Um, they don't have to pass their details on to anyone else. Um, the statement will only come down if, you know, that um, the uh, the person who's posted the statement doesn't reply to the notice of complaint. So, you know, we we think that that's a. Uh, uh, unnecessary um, or uh, it, it, it goes against this idea about freedom of expression. It takes us too far. Uh, so we think that the, the approach we're taking in the bill to secondary publishers um, is appropriate and it allows the court to determine um, whether a, a statement is defamatory and whether it should come down and not just leave it up to um, the vagaries of the, the takedown procedure. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I suppose the only risk of that is that with the takedown procedure, it, it disappears, and 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 that you know is, is better for the the complainant in that sense, um, because you know court action and, and and everything takes a long time, and that that statement defamatory material could still be there for some time. It's not defamatory, and if it hasn't been proved to be it defamatory, then it, that isn't very good for the author. So we're back to the balancing act again, aren't we? Mm. Um, so, you know, in answer to your previous question about what does somebody do, you know, if there's a defamatory statement about them online. So obviously, you know, they, they could go to court, they could use the simplified court procedure, um, you know, they can use that without a solicitor if, if they want to. Um, the costs there start at, you know, as little as £19 and, and that procedure could then be used to ask the court for um, damages or for the statement to be removed from the website. So that, that's the sort of process, process that somebody could go through. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, computer. Uh, thank you very much. Um, James Kelly, I think, wants to ask about um, the defences that are provided for in the bill. James. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener, and good morning, Minister. In terms of the defences that were codified in the bill around truth, honest opinion, and publication in the public interest, um, the, these were broadly welcomed by the witnesses that we heard from. Um, however, in in terms of truth, there was some concern expressed that only the sting of the allegation uh, needed to, to be proven. And also in relation to honest opinion, there was some concern that there wasn't enough protection for satire or hyperbole. Um, having, li having listened to, to these witnesses' concerns, uh, what's the minister's view on these? And are there any areas that you would consider taking amendments forward, uh, having, having had the feedback from, from witnesses? Mm -hmm. No, so I, th I thank the member for um, the question on that area. You know, this has been very, very carefully considered um, in the bill in order to strike the right balance. And, and I think it has struck the right balance there um, in terms of things like um, satire, hyperbole, etc. So um, I'll ask Michael just to, to go into a little bit more detail on the defences. I mean, in terms of satire um, and such, um, I mean, the, the Scottish Law Commission obviously considered this point um, and they were of the view that the sort of the glue of the honest opinion defence is that the opinion 
is genuinely held by um, the person who makes the statement. Um, I mean, the, I think the Faculty of Advocates also pointed to a case, um, McLeod versus Newsquest, which um, the court this, uh, took a look at um, the matter of satire or parody. Um, and it was a case where the action was raised um, about the content of a sketch piece, um, and it was dismissed on the basis that the ordinary reader would have understood that the article had been written for his or her entertainment in a cheerful, irreverent and playful spirit and had contained elements of fantasy. So we think that the, the, there is enough protection um, as it stands for satire and parody, um, and you know, we think that the, the drafting achieves the, the, the aims. Okay, um, in interesting in that answer you referred to previous case law. Well, one of the issues that came up was that uh, people uh, understandably felt that uh, strong case law was going to be important in relation to defences. And as mentioned earlier in the session, there was a lot of support for the, the Reynolds defence and the principles around that. Um, the government given any consideration to setting out those principles on the face of the bill um, to make it clearer and stronger? Well, the bill does um, place the current um, Reynolds defence onto a statutory footing um, and the explanatory notes to the bill make that explicit. So that's in paragraph 41 if uh, the committee want to, to check that. So, I mean, I would expect that previous case law in relation to the fence would continue to apply. Um, you know, the courts will um, continue to, to take that into consideration. Um, but, you know, I am interested in the committee's view on this as well. And um, I can, um, I certainly would be, would be, I'd be able to commit to reflecting on whether, you know, there is any further clarification that's needed on that. But I'll, I'll wait with interest the committee's report on uh, and any recommendation that might be forthcoming on that particular issue. Okay, um, I'm sure the committee will just... Oh, he's broken up. Lost Sorry, convener, some interruption there. Um, I'm sure the, the, the committee will reflect on that. I mean, I know that, that you say it's in the explanatory notes. Um, could be the case if it's on the face of the bill, uh, that would be stronger and clearer. But that's something that we all. Thank you, uh, James. Um, we're going to move now, Minister, to a malicious publication, and Liam Kerr has questions about that. Liam. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, Minister. Uh, yes, yeah, so part two uh, malicious publication. The, you're clearly in favour of the serious harm test for defamation, uh, but the serious harm test does not appear in the malicious publication. Section. Can you explain your thinking behind that, please? Yes, it doesn't. So, um, obviously, you know, we have defamation and then we have malicious publication. And I'm sure the member is aware they are distinct um, causes of action. So, malicious publication obviously covers statements which are likely to be highly damaging, but are not necessarily defamatory. And I think um, we all would recognise that this difference um, results in a different balance being taken between, the, the, between those two things. So the bill doesn't lower the threshold for malicious publication compared to defamation. Um, it recognises there are two, you know, there are different actions. Um, it's a different balance that needs to be sought, and um, and there are other tests that that will need to come into play for malicious publication. But would the minister not accept that it, it rather does lower the threshold if you take the argument? So the. the the statement has caused or is likely to cause financial loss. Now, I think I'm right in saying that there is no definition of financial loss. Uh, there's no de minimis on that. Uh, and secondly, if it's only likely to cause financial loss, that's not a very serious harm test, is it? And therefore, would you not have to conclude that if there's a serious harm test earlier in, the, in, in part one, there ought to be a, a serious harm test in part two, no? Well, there are two distinct causes of action, so I wouldn't necessarily accept that logic that you would have to have the same, um, th you know, test of threshold for two different actions. That doesn't necessarily follow, to my mind. I think that we have struck an appropriate balance here as well, and um, you know, there are there are additional tests, as a member rightly points out, the one for um, proving financial loss. So I'll let um, would it be Joanna that would be able to speak speak to this one about the tests of malice and. Yes, yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, yes, well, I think that we think that um, 
the the sorry the government thinks that um, the malicious publication has the falsity test and the malice test test to be hurdles to to overcome, um, and putting another serious uh, serious harm test is not necessarily relevant. Whereas if you look at defamation, the option is that um, falsity and malice are presumed. And so those hurdles don't have to be overcome. And so se the serious harm threshold is an option there. Thank you for that. I, th I think that's a reasonable point. I understand the point you're making about the, the, the different uh, hurdles that have to be uh, and the different operation of that. But let me take, uh, I'll address my question to the Minister at this stage, uh, let me take you to that uh, point about malice because the way that malice has been defined in sections 21, 22 and 23 uh, suggests that all that needs to be shown is that the imputation was or that the uh, maker's statement was indifferent as to the truth of the imputation. Uh, now, that seems to me, or as we've looked at through these committee sessions, that uh, indifference as to uh, the effect of the statement is, um, is a rather low threshold, isn't it? Uh, what do you say to that? I wouldn't agree that it's a low threshold, actually. I wouldn't agree with that at all. So the Scottish Law Commission, they gave, you know, they gave a great deal of consideration to this overall issue you know, of verbal injury and the new statutory cause of action of malicious publication. And I think the definition, the definition of malice um, that um, the Commission has come up with does, in my opinion, um, accurately reflect the common law position. Um, Joan, I don't know if you have anything further to add to that on the definition um, of malice. No, I don't have anything further to add, sorry. Thank you. I'm not sure, I just make this as a, a point, and Minister Balmain's come back at me, but I'm not sure that this does just reflect the common law position. Um, I think you, when you're talking about the common law, you're referring to the verbal injury. Now, that is an area in which the law has been described as obscure and uncertain. Uh, so if that's right, isn't this an opportunity to codify that and make sure that it's right, rather than simply, uh, if you're, you're right, that we're just reflecting uh, an obscure and uncertain position, isn't this a missed opportunity to codify, uh, to remove these ambiguities? Hmm. Well, I think the committee has heard some evidence on this, have, they, have you not, um, from the Faculty of Advocates and also from um, Dr Stephen Bogle, and they agreed that the definition is a reflection of the present law. Uh, further question, you've just had questions from James Kelly around defences. Now, when I'm looking through it, so this is obviously a codification, as you say, uh, in part one of the current defences as they exist. I don't see the same defences applying in part two. Uh, now, if, am I right on that, that the defences don't apply in part two? And if not, why not? So it's not exactly the same. So in terms of the defences, the defence of, of fair comment would apply and um, the defence of absolute privilege would also apply, and um, the defence of truth would apply. So th those are the ones that would apply, and um, for malicious publication. So yeah. I hope that, does that clear that up for the committee? It does. Could you, uh, and it's a genuine question, could you tell me how, where it does that? Like, what is it? So, so I accept the Minister's assertion, um, but where is it that it says these particular defences will apply as a defence to part two? Okay, I'll let Michael um, give you the detail on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I think the, the, the defences, um, or the, the way the bill is structured um, with uh, Master's publication in part two, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure um, that it's... Uh, obvious necessarily how the defences would apply, but I think the, the Law Commission in their, um, I think it was a discussion paper, um, make very clear what defences would apply to malicious publication. The malicious publication, what we did here in the bill, is not necessarily you know, codify it to the same extent that we have done for defamation law. Uh, so we, we don't go into, um, you know, clearing up you know, what defences would apply in malicious publication, um, but the, the defences that we do put in the bill for truth, for honest opinion, um, and obviously we touch on absolute privilege, those would apply for a malicious publication action. 
Uh, I muse then, would that be an area that's right for amendment just to make absolutely clear in the bill uh, sections X, Y and Z will apply as defences to part two? Uh, Minister, do you think there's value in, in pursuing that? I would, cert I would look at it. You know, I could certainly commit that I would, lo I would look at it very carefully if very an amendment grateful. was put forward on that. Uh, one more question, if I may, Convener, uh, and it's simply this. I, 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 I listened to the, the Minister not necessarily accepting my premise that the threshold might have been lowered for this, uh, but certainly some stakeholders have suggested that there could be a lower threshold, just with the lack of the serious harm test and definition of malice, mm. for example. Does the Minister accept that there is a risk that malicious publication be becomes the, the part of choice uh, for those wishing to assert effectively defamation uh, as a, a way to avoid the high, higher thresholds that the Minister is introducing in Part 1 uh, to prevent defamation actions? I don't think so. I, I can see the, the point the Member is making with that, but I think that you know, there would still be a requirement to um, prove falsity um, there's still a requirement to, to prove financial loss, as we've already discussed. So I, I, I don't expect that it would, but I, I think it's an interesting point that the member is raising. Very grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Fulton McGregor, I think, wants to ask about court orders to remove uh, material. Fulton. Uh, thanks, convener, and uh, good morning uh, to, the, to the minister. Yes, yeah, the convener says I want to uh, ask about the section 30 of the bill. I've been asking about this. Um, about the evidence gathering, um, which is uh, a, a, an, intermediary, an intermediary measure um, before the court has reached a final decision. Now, we've heard some mixed views in this, Minister, um, with some stakeholders um, being quite in favour of it, of Section 30, and others, particularly media stakeholders, um, suggesting that it could be disproportionate, um, forcing to remove material which might not be foundry um, in the end. So I, I'm wondering what, what, what your view um, on this is, Minister, and, and if you could speak a wee bit about the, the justification and the thinking um, from the government um, behind legislating in this area. Um, I think that's an important point that the members raised. Um, I think it would be helpful if I you know, make clear to the committee that the power of the court to order the operator of a website uh, on which a, um, a defamatory statement is posted, um, you know, to remove the statement. So even if that's just as an interim measure, that can only be exercised once court proceedings have been commenced. So the court will have, you know, therefore an opportunity to hear from, from both parties where possible. Um, and I think it is important that the court has that, that flexibility to be able to, you know, in an appropriate case, you know, to take really prompt action um, to protect reputation. I would expect these type of cases to be really rare as well, um, but I think it's important that we do have that provision in the bill. Um, I think the committee's heard evidence on this, that you know, the, the approach is reasonable, you know, that it's only likely to be used in, um, you know, when it's absolutely necessary that it needs to be used. And I think it's also worth pointing out as well that uh, the courts currently possess this power, and um, I don't think we're aware of any evidence that, you know, that the courts are abusing it at the moment. Okay. Um, convener, I, I know I've only had the one question, but I am quite happy with that answer. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Fulton. Um, uh, Liam MacArthur wants to ask about time limits, please. Yeah. Um, Minister, we talked earlier about the serious harm um, threshold. I think the other area where um, it's been identified that um, the, the, the thresholds have, have changed quite markedly in that balance the convener was talking about perhaps shift is in relation to, to time limits. Partly the reduction um, uh, from three years to one year um, when a defamation uh, claim can be brought forward, uh, but also uh, in terms of um, uh, stating that that needs to be from the point of publication rather the point at, at which an individual becomes aware um, of, uh, of, of that claim. There are concerns that have been um, raised about the, the impact, both those who have individually and, and collectively. Uh, one, I think, where there may be some delay in, in terms of an individual becoming aware of, of, of a statement having been made. I think the other, in terms of cases where perhaps the initial publication wasn't sufficient to 
um, uh, to, 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 to justify or provoke um, uh, such a, a, a case being brought, but the cumulative impact of, um, of repetition of, of that statement, then um, I think uh, leading the, the, the individual to, to feel that they have no other option but to bring a defamation case. I just wonder how um, you, you feel the bill uh, would be able to address those, those sorts of concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I mean, I do, I do think that if someone is, you know, suffering damage to their reputation, they are usually going to become aware of it quite quickly, I would say, in, in uh, most cases. So I think that, um, again, we're back to this balancing act again, aren't we, between, you know, balancing the time and um, how long something should take. So I think that the one year, I do, I do think that strikes the right balance. It's enough time to, you know, assess that damage and to prepare for litigation or to in, um, possibly to engage in alternative dispute resolution if that is um, you know, um, appropriate in that case. So I would say as well, though, that the court does have discretion to allow litigation to proceed um, you know, out with the one year period of, of, of limitation um, where it considers that you know, there's a good reason to do that. So you know, the, the example that you've given there where you know, something comes to the attention of the individual, maybe close to the end of the of the time period after publication, or maybe it's a, a sort of a cumulative effect. If if the person can say, you know, that there has been the defamatory statements, um, and they can, you know, that it has caused them serious harm, um, the court, you know, will, could make an allowance for that. Basically, they have that discretion to allow that to proceed, even if it was after the one year period. So I, ho I hope that does strike the right balance. Would that latitude the court have also address concerns that were raised, partly in relation to time limits, but, but also in terms of the the, um, the, the the question around secondary publication, where actually where the, the statements initially made uh, because of perhaps the the audience that that statement is able to, mm -hmm. to reach, the, the the case for defamation is is, is more questionable, but where repeated by um, uh, someone or or, or, or or on a different platform that has a far greater reach. Um, the, the, the case for, for, mm. for defamation and, and meeting the serious harm threshold, etc., is more obviously made. Would the court have um, sufficient dis discretion to, mm -hmm. to uh, take that into account? It would, because if more prominence was given to the statement, you know, subsequent publication, um, that would, I think, be considered to be a material difference. And then that would um, result in a restarting of, of the one year clock. So I think this is quite a flexible approach. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Also on um, flexibility in court process and in terms of balancing the various interests, Shona Robeson has some questions about protecting from unjustified threats. Shona, please. Thank you, convener. Um, good, good morning, uh, Minister. The first question I have is um, around the Scottish Pens uh, proposal to introduce a form of court action to protect against unjustified threats, which has received support from some stakeholders, others not uh, so supportive. Um, is this something that the, the government uh, consulted on? And can you say a bit about why it doesn't feature in this bill? Hmm. I don't think it is a good, I don't think it's a good fit for the law of defamation, which is why um, it hasn't been taken forward. And it's also raised some potential human rights concerns, which I'll let the officials um, speak to in a moment. Um, I think an unjustified threats provision um, is likely to make things much more difficult. So I wonder if one of the officials could, Michael, would that be? Yeah, yeah Michael, I'll give a bit more detail on that. I'm, I think in, in terms of the unjustified threats, um, what, we, what we have found is that, or, or what our concern is, um, is that it, it won't have the intended effect that Scottish Pen think it would have. Obviously, they are... They are concerned um, that uh, threatening letters being received um, will, you know, and obviously the effect that that has. Um, they think that having a, a, you know, the deal out of unjustified threats would stop those letters, and it, it may very well do. But what we think it, it, it may do is instead just people will cut out that initial step and simply go straight to court, which I don't think is the, the solution that anyone wants. Um, obviously, unjustified threats comes from um, <coughs> intellectual property law, and 
you know, their things are potentially more absolute than they are in defamation. Um, so ultimately, you know, it was, it was something that we consulted on, we considered, but ultimately it's something that we don't think should be taken forward. Can I just come back in on there, Kamina? I think as well, I mean, one of the primary aims of this bill is to simplify things uh, and to make it, you know, and to add clarity. I think, uh, you know, unjustified threats, I think it would add complexity that isn't necessarily appropriate in this, in this area. So if you think about, um, you know, defamation proceedings, what we've got now is, you know, we've got the, the test of serious harm, we've got the new statutory defences, we've got the offer of amends. So all of these things, when you take them together, should give the defenders confidence to, to resist that threat of litigation. So I don't think that unjustified threats is um, it's warranted, and I also think it would just add, um, you know, complexity that isn't necessary. OK. Um, I mean, while we're on that subject, then, witnesses have um, also highlighted the, what they perceive as the intimidatory nature of pre-litigation correspondence um, and have talked about a pre-action protocol, which obviously exists in England for media and communication cases. Would that be a, a, a better way, potentially, of controlling the pre-litigation environment? And is that something that the Minister uh, would consider looking at? some kind of similar protocol uh, in Scotland? Yeah, so I've seen some of the evidence that the, the committee's taken on this, and, you know, I understand that it's felt that this is quite helpful in England, so it's certainly something that I um, I could I could look at, but it is a matter for the Scottish Civil Justice Council, though. Um, but if the committee are, you know, particularly interested in, in this, then, of course, I could write to... Um, you know, the Scottish Civil Justice Council on those terms, to, you know, to ask them to consider t taking such initiative if the committee were of that mind. OK, I think, I think that would be helpful. That's obviously something the committee can discuss, but um, it would be helpful, I think, to know their views. Uh, and just finally, um, witnesses uh, to the committee have referred to uh, what they call anti-SLAP, which is a strategic lawsuit against public participation actions. Uh, as a more uh, direct way of dealing with litigation, uh, which is motivated by a desire to stifle criticism, so that in some uh, North American jurisdictions, um, a defendant can argue that litigation threats threatens their right to free speech. And if the court agrees, the plaintiff must show that their action is more likely than not to succeed before they can continue. So, uh, really, my question is, what are the, the government's views on incorporating a protection of this nature into the bill? Is that something that you've considered? Um, I don't think that that would... It's, it's not something that I've, I've, I've a mind to kind of bring forward at the moment. I think, you know, the balance the bill is striking should give content creators confidence now um, in terms of, um, you, know, you know, if they're publishing material that's in the public interest. So I, I don't think something like that would be necessary. OK, I'm happy with that, Convino. Thank you. Thank you, Shona, very much. I think Liam Kerr has a quick supplementary before Liam MacArthur. Liam. Yes, thank you, Convino. It's just, if, if I may, Mr, take you back to the limitation questions. Uh, can you explain to me again, just genuinely, I just didn't quite catch it, uh, why, if we reduce the limitation to one year, shouldn't it be from a date of knowledge rather than from the date of publication as is envisaged here? Uh, and secondly, arising from that, because I listened to the answer about look, a court uh, has, has the ability to extend the time limit if, according to Section 19A of the Prescription Act, if it's equitable to do so. Now, as you know, I come out of an employment law background, and certainly in that legislation, the, the criteria uh, for, extending the legislation, uh, for extending the limitation is, is pretty clear. Now... Might this be an opportunity to look again? Is equitable the best test for extending it, or should it be uh, perhaps not reasonably practicable to have presented a claim within the one year? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, re the you know the the motivation for reducing the, the time period, as I, I was discussing when I was um, speaking to Mr. MacArthur, is you know that this the the, the fear, the threat of you know defamation proceedings um, on content creators. You know, years and years and years after uh, they've published that content, I think has a real chilling effect 
on, on people that are creating content. So I think that's the balance that we're, we're looking to strike here to, to make that appropriate. Um, Michael, did you want to come back in on some of the other points that you yeah, raised? Yeah, I mean, I think on the, on the idea about data of knowledge, um, obviously we think that um, the data of knowledge and data of publication are more likely to coincide than not. Um, so the, the, the data of publication is a more, um, a more definite and more fixed point. Um, we do obviously make allowance, um, as the Minister spoke to you about the, the, the material difference. Um, there is an allowance for that, for the, um, the starting of the one-year period. Um, I would say on the issue about um, Section 19, I think it was 19A, Mr Kerr referred to, that comes from the general law of prescription. Um, and, uh, you know, if we were to make changes to that, I don't think it should necessarily come through defamation law. Um, so it may have... Um, wider implications than perhaps um, what we've discussed here. Thank you. Liam McArthur, please. Uh, thanks, could I um, turn to the, the issue of um, accessibility? We've kind of skirted around a wee bit in, in, in earlier questioning, but um, I think one of the points that were made by um, media representatives, for example, is the changing shape of the media environment at the moment, um, the use of far more freelancers, for example, who um, often will not have the, the, the weight of a legal department behind them. And I wonder what consideration had been given to what um, information, advice and support uh, could be made available, uh, either produced by, funded by uh, the Scottish Government, to at least give um, those sorts of individuals a degree of reassurance that they, they, they understood their rights and, uh, and the responsibilities under the, the law, even if in due course for more detailed advice they would almost certainly need to seek um, uh, the uh, support of, of their own solicitors. But, is there, a, is there a role for the Scottish Government, particularly in terms of, of bringing forward um, this piece of, of, uh, of legislation um, that could provide at least some support for, uh, for those who may need it? I'll give that some thought. Um, I think, you know, one of the key strengths of this is that we're, we're bringing all of the key issues of defamation, you know, into one piece of, of legislation. Um, you know, modernising it, modernising the language, which will in itself make it more accessible um, because people will know where to go, they can read it for themselves and they can understand what, what their rights and obligations under the law of defamation are. But I, I'll give the members point some thought. It would be helpful. I mean, the, I mean, the point you make is, is a valid one, uh, Minister, but actually it, it probably suggests that now is an opportune moment mm -hmm. for, for providing um, some, some supported documentation that, that at least gives uh, mm -hmm. people that general level of understanding. The other point um, w that was made was that uh, even seeking legal advice about whether or not to uh, instigate or, or, or defend a, a defamation case, um, the, the cost can very quickly um, rise. Uh, and I wonder again what, whether the Scottish Government's given any consideration to uh, changing the, the, the rules around access to legal aid uh, in, in cases of defamation. I haven't at the moment. I don't. I don't. I'm not. Um, I haven't got any plans to, you know, review legal aid or how it, um, you know, what tests apply to defamation at this point. Would it, would it be something um, that the government's willing to, to, to look at exploring the extent to which this is an inhibitor for, for people um, um, either taking a, a, a case or, as I say, um, deciding whether or not to, de to defend it? I think, you know, the, the Scottish government has, has pursued, you know, access to justice and, and modernising, um, you know, civil litigation to quite an extent. You know, obviously we've got the you know, the Civil Litigation Act of 2018. So, you know, we've got a more accessible and um, a more affordable civil justice system in Scotland. You know, I've already talked about the simplified procedure. So I think, you know, on balance, um, you know, you can raise an action for damages quite um, inexpensively, um, you know, going through the simple procedure. So I think that because those routes are available, I think that, um, you know, there isn't an access to justice issue here as far as I'm concerned. So it's not something that I've, I've got in mind to do to, re to review um, legal aid on that point. And, and following up the point, um, I think Shona Robinson was talking around the, the, the Scottish Pen proposal um, for um, a, a sort of um, pre-action procedure that might um, uh, speed mm -hmm. things up, reduce costs, etc. Yeah. Um, I think it was Professor Scott also referred to um, perhaps the introduction of a preliminary processor hearing uh, which could deal with takedown uh, requests mm -hmm. and also make, uh, I suppose, quite quick decisions on whether words uh, have a defamatory uh, meaning. 
um, and I wondered whether this was this was something that the government were prepared to, to look into further. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right in saying, my officials will correct me if I'm wrong, that both of those would come under the Scottish Civil Justice Council and under court rules. Is that correct? They would do, they would do yes. Um, I mean, I think what perhaps Mr MacArthur um, is perhaps referring to is maybe more case management powers for sheriffs. Um, they would obviously be able to um, direct proceedings um, according to the nature of, of defamation. So there would be scope to... Um, have a single meaning hidden um, to attribute the, the meaning to the defamatory statement. Um, and certainly under simplified procedure, um, sheriffs have um, a great deal of scope for case management powers. Um, and I know that the, the Scottish Civil Justice Council were looking at a, a, a wider review of ordinary procedure, um, and, and one of that was to give sheriffs uh, more case management powers as well. So there's there's, um, you know, I think the, the direction of travel is certainly towards allowing sheriffs more freedom to direct the proceedings, and certainly that would be of value in defamation law. Right. I mean, maybe back to the, the, the minister, I mean, it, it would appear from what you're saying that a certain degree of latitude already exists, but, but I think from the evidence we've taken, there is perhaps a question as to whether or not that latitude is being uh, used as, as widely as it, as it were, so I think uh, as it should be, and, and therefore I suppose ahead of uh, investing further powers in the, the, this area, actually understanding why there may be a, a, a resistance to, to using them in the way that's been suggested might be a, a vulnerable exercise. I think that is a, that is a fair point. You know, if the committee, you know, have an interest in that and a recommendation on that, I'd be happy to write to the Scottish Civil Justice Council to, you know, express maybe a benefits of early determination, that type of thing under the case management. And certainly that's something that I would do. Okay. Thanks, thank you very much. Uh, no member has indicated that they wish to ask any further questions, Minister. So can I thank you very warmly um, and thank also your officials for um, the help that you've given us uh, in the committee this morning. Um, that concludes the evidence taking that this committee will um, undertake uh, on this bill at stage one and it also concludes the public part of our meeting today that our next meeting is a week today on tuesday the 29th of september when we will take evidence from gil patterson msp on his post-mortem examinations defense time limit scotland bill and we will now move into private session but before we do that i will suspend for five minutes so we will reconvene in private at 11:17. thank you